Wee Wee by God's design? If so, what was he thinking? Let's talk about it with author Eric Shoemaker on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. We consider it a high and holy compliment that you would spend an hour out of your busy schedule with us. And we're going to, we're not going to waste it. You're going to be glad you were here. You always have a place at our table. We just don't let you talk. And if you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here. Matthew hosted this program last week, and there were no riots. So, <laughs> so mission thank, accomplished. Listen, I asked and listened, and you shine. Thank you. You do. In fact, I'm not going to let you do it anymore. <laughs> uh, I, there, there are some things that I'm simply not going to do very often. I need this job. Our producer, Jinx, is in his little glass booth. Jinx is so tough, he's broken five bones. None of them were his. No, I have not broken a bone yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. Here in Florida, it's so hot that John Myers has switched to Celsius just to feel a bit cooler. And I preached last Sunday at my home church. The title was, So You, it was on hell. Mm -hmm. So You Think It's Hot Here. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George just gave a college commencement speech. It was titled, Graduation. <laughs> the last time. You'll be appreciated for just showing up. <laughs> and then Kathy is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy has developed a new food product inspired by Matthew's intro jokes. It's called, I can't believe it's not better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a great program today. Um, one of our favorite guests is Eric Shoemaker. He's an author, a songwriter, and and if the interview goes sour, we'll have him sing. <laughs> He's an author, a songwriter, and a podcaster, and he currently serves as the pastoral ministry director for the Baptist Convention of Iowa. Eric has written and co-written several books and the latest, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is titled The Good Gift of Weakness, God's Strength Made Perfect in the Story of Redemption. By, by the way, Eric, I noticed and read this morning the introduction or the preface that Paul wrote, Paul Tripp. Uh, I and I just wonder, and I suspect there are people in our audience who wonder, man, he has been to the edge of death and a hard time, and he's been on this program. And how's he doing? Uh, he is. He's hanging in there. You know, he. I, I. I just interviewed Paul on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast about his health journey. And uh, he's pretty frank about the weakness that he's encountering from the illness that he walked through. And uh, he, you know, he's finding his strength in Jesus. Uh, his productivity level uh, has been cut drastically. And, but he is, he's using all the energy that he has to tell others about the power that's found in the gospel. You know, that's what Paul does. Uh, oh, he does. And uh, has meant a lot to me. And, and his uh, preface or introduction, I forget which, they are interchangeable, <laughs> was, uh, was profound, I thought. Mm -hmm. But not as profound as what you wrote. You wrote this because you are a star, because you're strong, you sell a lot of books, you preach great sermons, and you run 
quickly in races, and you sing beautifully the songs that you've written, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, they say if you, if, you, if you can't do something, you should coach. And I don't know how to be weak, so I thought I'd help other people learn how. <laughs> tell us, tell us about you, and uh, and I know that you don't mind the question. You're so authentic that you scare me sometimes. I say often, I don't believe I would have said that. Uh, but you are writing from your own personal weakness, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I'm well, a little bit about myself. You, you read a bunch of stuff about me there. Um, I'm less impressive than that sounds. Uh, <laughs> I've been married. <laughs> I've been married to Jenny for almost 26 years. Uh, we've got five kids. We live here in Iowa and our, our second born is getting married on Saturday and I'm officiating his wedding. So we're excited about that. Um, I was in pastoral ministry for 20 years. And now, as you said, I'm the pastoral ministry director which basically means I'm building relationships with pastors and telling them what not to do uh, because I've made, I've made enough mistakes in, in two decades that, um, but you know, this book, it's a, it's a theological book. It, you know, as it traces the theme of weakness through scripture, but it's not a theology project for me. In some ways, this is a, this is a life or death hanging on by white knuckles sort of thing where I tried long enough uh, in Christian world to be strong and impressive and great and figured that all of my happiness and joy would come from being an awesome spectacle of spiritual strength. And the Lord brought me to the absolute end of myself. And I, I was collapsed in, on the floor in a heap at the end of myself, not wanting to live anymore because I couldn't do it. And I needed grace. And uh, this project was really my way of, of looking and seeing, is there a place for weakness in the Bible for weak people like me? And uh, the answer is, yeah, it's, it's the only kind of people that make it into God's kingdom is, is weak people. You know, the great thing about your book, I, I get the weakness thing. Uh, been there, done that, made a fool of myself enough. I always tell God, you could have been gentler. I mean, <laughs> if you really loved me, I would have gotten around to it. You didn't have to do that. Uh, but he's not very gentle. He's the lion of Judah. And sometimes sometimes it hurts like hell. And you just, <laughs> you, you just think... I can't do this anymore where you were, but I, I get that. I, and, and those of us who work at key life, we get that. That's a part of our message, but what is so new and absolutely wonderful about your book is the way you trace weakness as a central factor from Genesis to revelation throughout the story of the people of God. If I were God, frankly, I would have included, <laughs> there's some things I wouldn't have said. I mean, I'd have left out, I'd have left out a lot of people, frankly, but he didn't. Were you surprised when you started doing research at how often that's the central factor? I figured it would be. I had an inkling, but I was surprised. And especially when you start reading through the storyline of Israel, you know, God makes this promise that this Redeemer is going to show up. He's going to be someone who crushes the head of the serpent. So you're looking for this strong, conquering figure. The rest of the Old Testament is looking for this guy to show up and redeem us. And as you're, as you're watching this, this line of progression, looking for him, the family of Abraham that the, the promise is going through I mean, the only thing they deserve is like a recurring spot on the Jerry Springer show. They, they, I mean, they make Duck Dynasty look normal. Like if they had a reality TV show, it, it, they, they're messed up. And um, I, I was just, and, the, and I think the other surprising thing was how the steps God takes that he goes through to highlight weakness. You know, you get into the judges and you have Gideon, this chicken hearted man who's hiding in a, you know, a, you know, he's hiding to, 
well, avoid avoid things because he's scared. And God God calls him this valiant warrior, which is kind of tongue in cheek. And and then he gives them an army, and he's like, "Your army is way too big. We need to cut it down from thirty thousand to three hundred or whatever." Um, he God just goes to great lengths to show, like, "You're I'm I'm going to do all the work." through weak people. I'm going to do it in a way that shows I'm the only one who did the work. And Paul said that the jars of clay thing, you know, I don't like that because it runs counter to everything that we've been taught. I mean, work Mm. at it, show your excellence, be better than anybody else. And then if you work hard enough at it, maybe God will deem to use you. And uh, when you read the scriptures and you read this book, you begin to see it's not that way at all. At first, you'll be embarrassed. At first, you'll want to run. At first, you'll think, huh, I ain't going to do that. I listen. And then it begins to hit you that God uses normal, weak people like me and like you. The name of the book is The Good Gift of Weakness. The name of the author is Eric Schumachmaker, and uh, the subtitle is God's Strength Made Perfect in the Story of Redemption. Don't go anywhere. Like Jesus, we're going to return. Joining us, we're talking with author Eric Shoemaker. Eric's new book is called The Good Gift of Weakness. You didn't know that. The Good Gift of Weakness. God's strength made perfect in the story of redemption. Eric, as we're talking about embracing weakness, understanding that as uh, part of God's design, I know there's going to be some folks who go, wait a second. You're saying it's okay to be sinful. Can you help us extricate those two terms, weakness versus uh, sinfulness or sin sin nature? Yeah, that's a great question because I think the first thing that we think about, I think, so this is the this is the response I get to the book from people who are reading it. It you know before it comes out, is they're stopping and they're messaging me halfway through the first chapter, going, "Whoa." So weakness is part of our design. It's not bad to be weak because we automatically think that being weak is part of the fall and it has to do with the entrance of sin into the world. And that is not the case. You know, Steve mentioned uh, before the break that Paul talked about these jars of clay and we're not jars of clay after the fall. I mean, we are jars of clay after the fall, but we're jars of clay by design. I mean, what did God make us out of? He made us out of dirt. He took dirt and fashioned it into a vessel of a body, and then he breathed life into it. So being jars of clay has been his design from the very beginning. And if we read the creation narrative, one of the things we see is that we depend. So to be, let me back up a step. To be weak means to be in a, unable to produce an effect or to act. And part of my argument in the first chapter is that by design, we are unable, apart from God's help, to do anything. We can't exist. We can't sustain our own existence. We depend upon him to give us food, uh, clothing, a place, a purpose. Everything we have, you know, as, as we read next, we, we live and move and have our being uh, in God. We depend upon him for everything. So we are naturally weak. And that's a good thing because God designed us in the beginning to live by his gracious provision through faith uh, from beginning to end. That's so good. I, and it's probably because I'm worse than a lot worse than you are. And I would go further. I did. I think that we, that sin, I mean, real sin 
is the best gift that God ever gave us when we know it. And our obedience and faithfulness and strength is our most dangerous area when we know that. That's sort of depressing. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's freeing, too, when you think I about know. it. I know. You know, if I haven't surprised him in my weakness and my sin, then we've got a bigger problem than my weakness and my sin at any rate. Eric, in um, Chapter 11, you start off um, telling a a pretty dismal story um, about, your, about yourself and being on the floor um, in your study all night long and, and et cetera. And, um, and the chapter is titled Weakness in the Church. And at the end of telling the story, you mentioned that Jesus would show you that you weren't, you know, you said, you said to him, I'm, I'm not strong enough to be a pastor. And, and he said that, um, that you weren't weak enough. Um, and so <laughs> then you go, then you go into six or seven different things that deal with weakness. One of which was to imitate the weakness of Christ. And I was like, Oh my gosh. But I wonder, I wanted to kind of center in a little bit on, uh, I think it was number six in that section where you talk about where it says, don't, af- don't appear, don't be afraid to appear weak. Um, I know where you're, because I've read it. I know where you're going, but that seems really difficult to land on. And I mean, nobody wants to give the impression that they're weak. I don't think we don't want others to see us sweat. Well, yeah. It, so, can you kind of elaborate a little bit on on that um, on that whole idea about not being afraid to be weak? Mm. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a great point because we, we are naturally afraid to be weak. And I think, I think the reason we're afraid to, to appear weak to people is because we're, we're worried about, one, will they take advantage of our weakness? Will they mm-hmm. exploit that against us? Two, will, what will they think of us? You know, will we lose our standing with people? And those are gospel issues uh, because we, if we're depending upon our status and our validation and our acceptance and what other people think of us, then we've shifted our focus from our standing in the gospel that we're fully and finally approved of based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, who was righteous for us, died for us, rose for us. And we're fully and finally accepted in God. And our acceptance doesn't depend upon what other people think of us. God has seen us at our absolute weakest, including our moral weakness, uh, he's he's seen all the sins that we've confessed and all those we haven't confessed and all those that we don't even know about. And we're fully righteous in his sight. Um, and when and, and then the other is how will people exploit our, our weakness against us? And um, man, if we have a if we have a, a savior who sees us at our very worst and loves us and he says, I'm never leaving you and I'm never forsaking you and my spirit's going to dwell within you. And I am entirely for you and not against you. If we have a father who says, I've given my son for you, no one can stand against you. We don't have to worry about people exploiting our weakness or judging us because of our weakness, because of who Christ is for us and who we are in him. Mm. I, I read not so long ago a statement, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I'm the meanest SOB in the valley. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, you can be weak and still mean. I mean, you, you could write. <laughs> I just thought I'd say this. Somebody has to say it. I thought that you, the next book you write ought to be, be um, the good gift of not being mean. <laughs> but until you write that book, I'm going to be weak. I'm going to tell people I'm weak. And I don't care if they know I'm weak, but leave me alone. Because <laughs> I'm the meanest SOB in the valley. <laughs> We're going to come back. And uh, listen, there's another side of this that uh, you didn't bring up, but it's important. You know, we also think that other people are strong. Not like us, we're weak. And the surprise of being authentic 
before other people is to hear them say with total astonishment, you too. And then all of a sudden we join hands, you too, and walk off in the sunset together. And there's great freedom in that. Hey, listen, this is a great conversation and uh, we're glad you're a part of it. But get this book. This is a book you ought to read once a year. It's The Good Gift of Weakness. God's strength made perfect in the story of redemption. It'd be a great book for a small group study, uh, for a classroom textbook, uh, and uh, it could make a difference in your life, the life of your church, the life of your family, and then you can become mean. <laughs>caster, songwriter, author, Eric Shoemaker, and you can keep up with him at emshoemaker.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and X at emsshoemaker. No, not .com, just that. That's it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm doing the it. best I can, okay? That was okay. a nod to you and a correction of himself all rolled into one. Yeah, okay, an emphasis on that. Uh, Eric, you uh, do the kind of the design of the book. You, you go through basically the whole Bible and point out um, weakness revealed in the story of Israel. And, um, and by the way, for those reading through your Bible in a year, it would be a good thing to read through this, you know, every Mm. year. So (laughs) you kind of get that emphasis, but, uh, of course you come to the point of weaknesses, uh, weakness shown in, uh, Jesus's life incarnation and, and his story. Um, talk a little bit about that and why, why, (laughs) Why that's mm. important? Why did it happen? What? Yeah, we how does get, that fit in the story? We get why we ought to be weak, but couldn't Jesus have been a warrior or something? <laughs> well, that's what they expected. Uh, you know, uh, Isaiah says when he shows up, he'll be nothing to look at. He'll have no power or majesty, no beauty that we should want to look at him. Nothing that would make us desire him. He'll he'll look like a shoot coming out of dry ground. And if you're a farmer looking at a young plant coming up in a drought, uh, you're not going to bet on that plant to grow because it, it looks weak. Uh, why is it important to understand weakness in Jesus' life? You know, we, we just talked a little bit about in the previous segment about weakness in creation, that we are designed weak. And Jesus, in his incarnation, shows up as the perfect human being. And if we were designed to be weak, that means Jesus shows up in all of our weakness. And That is an amazing thing to think about. If you want to think about how much Jesus loves us, we think about the lengths he went to in the cross, which is the ultimate display of love, because there's nothing weaker than to be a a human being hanging on a piece of wood naked in front of the world as they mock you and then to die under God's wrath. Uh, But Jesus, the eternal second person of the Trinity, always in fellowship with God, He enters into human nature and just think of about how uncomfortable it is to live in these bodies in this world where we get food poisoning and we get infections and we, it hurts. And the older you get, the more it hurts. Um, You have these limitations and Jesus didn't come and live as one of the Avengers. You know, he didn't come live as a superhero. He got tired. He was exhausted. He got thirsty. He got hungry. Um, He he was so emotionally 
restrained. He is on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying in agony, sweating like drops of blood. And uh, he's he's beaten uh, by soldiers. Um, he enters into the, you know, the author of Hebrews says that he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he could be a merciful high priest, not just to atone for our sins, but so that he could sympathize with us in our weaknesses and in our temptations so that he could help us in time of need. So we have a savior who looks at me on the floor of my study in a fetal position, weeping and crying because I want my ministry responsibilities to be taken away from me because I just can't do this anymore. And Jesus says, Eric, I know exactly what that is like. He be, Think of the weakest place you've ever been, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, Jesus had to be made like us in every respect, but without sin. He knows what it is like to be a weak human being. He's not looking at you from this ivory tower. He knows experientially what it's like to be weak. And therefore, he can not only sympathize with us, but we can go to him and say, Jesus, I'm in this situation and I can't do it. And he knows exactly what kind of help we need. And because he loves us, because he was perfect in that situation for us and died for us, he is willing and able to give us exactly the strength and the power that we need in that moment. And it's, it seems, too, that not only do we get the sense uh, uh, that he knows but now we know that he knows. Yes. Have yeah. that sense of identification. And are called to do the same thing with other people. When we pretend mm. to be strong and we've got it together and we'll show you how to do that, we violate the essence of our witness. Mm. Our witness in the world is to identify with others the way Jesus has identified with us. That's a big deal for Jesus to do that. It's no big deal for us guys. <laughs> you know, all you got to do is tell the truth and you'd be surprised at how many people will beat a path to the church. The name of the book is The Good Gift of Weakness, God's Strength Made Perfect in the Story of Redemption. Eric takes what the Bible says, not what he says, and shows from Genesis to Revelation that you're not much. spending this time with us. By the way, if you don't get our free weekly e-life email, operative word free so you can't complain, our free weekly key life email, uh, sign up today at keylife.org slash subscribe and Eric will write a custom song just for you. <laughs> <laughs> not, yep. not only that, the song will be in a key that's good for your wow. vocal range. <laughs> that's, uh, Matthew, that's one of the best lines you ever wrote. <laughs> Listen, whatever it takes, you got to get this email. Oh, man. Uh, Eric, as we're talking about the weakness, and I think you know everybody's kind of wrapping their brain around this, but you know, at the same time, there's something in all of us that strives for, for excellence and, and, and uh, just doing, doing things well, quitting ourselves well. Can you help us reconcile those two? They feel like there's a tension between them, but there's there's not. One is related to the other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we think, well, if I embrace weakness, then that means that's just an excuse for me to be lazy and to do things poorly, to not develop my skills. Um, and and skill and excellence is something that's prized in the Bible when they built the temple. You know, they, they got 
the skilled craftsmen who would come and make the stuff that went into it and uh, applied their craft well. I think the question is, where does that skill come from? And how do we engage in trying to be excellent? And, you know, Paul asked the question, what do you have that you didn't receive? Uh, and, they, and obviously the answer is nothing. And, and if, if, if it is nothing, then why do you boast as though uh, you have something that's come from yourself? And so I think if we want to be excellent at a task, you know, I, I want to be an excellent counselor to people, you know, when I sit in my counseling office and help people in their struggles. And uh, I, I go into every session going, I, I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. And <laughs> I don't have a clue what I'm going to what I'm going to encounter. And I, and I realize going, I, I, I can I can open my, my mouth and say some incredibly stupid stuff. And and I don't want to hurt this person. And I pray at the beginning of every time going, Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Mm. I, I need your help going into this. And I'm, I'm finishing up a counseling degree right now. And I'm studying hard to, to be good at what I do there. But I also go in going, I know the Lord could snap his fingers and make me a miserable counselor. Um, and, you know, I think we learned that lesson from Nebuchadnezzar, you know, as he's you know, looking out over his kingdom going, look at what I built. And the next day he's an animal who's eating grass. And uh, that's, that's the attitude we want to have, you know, not like, uh, you know, under Joshua as they're taking the land, they go into AI thinking, oh, this is a small city. We can do this easily. And they get defeated. And the lesson they need to learn is, you know, the, the command there maybe this is a good place to go. The command to Joshua is be strong and be courageous, be strong. But you go read that chapter where he's commanding Joshua again and again to be strong. What does that mean? He, he says, be strong because I'm going to give you the land that I promised to your ancestors. Be strong because I'm going to be with you. Being strong means remembering God is going to do the work remembering God has promised to be with you. And so I think it's the same with excellence. Like, how do we be excellent? We say, Lord, give me gifts and what gifts you've given me, help me to improve them and then help me to exercise them out of a standpoint of faith in you and help me to do it for your glory. Help me not to exploit my excellence to serve myself, but like Jesus to humble myself and be a servant to other people through these things. That's good because, you know, there is a neurotic kind of thing that goes on sometimes among believers. Um, I've called it Harry and the humble habit when you, mm. when it's wringing your hands and sitting in the corner and waiting for him to call. I'm just a servant and I can't do anything. I get, tired of that sometimes and the way you point is not that it's speaking truth being glad for the gifts that god has given and not denying those mm -hmm. to to the world i don't have a lot but the ones that i do you know i'll tell everybody jill briscoe said that she gets all these compliments she said a long time ago for her speaking and writing and she said, those are flowers that I collect. And at night before I go to bed, I give the bouquets to Jesus. Mm. So maybe this is what this is about. Mm. Uh, would you rather write books or songs? Oh, wow. That's a question. I'd rather write <laughs> or, books. Or listen, it's like a cooter preference test. Would you rather write <laughs> books or songs or counsel hurting people. Oh, <laughs> wow! That I, oh, I'd rather do all three. You can't about, at the same time. How about Besides writing? Your, how about writing books that contain songs that help people? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Only Bingham go. would bring that up. Well, and another little insider tidbit, and this is free is I think Nebuchadnezzar is a warning to vegetarianism. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Turn yes. you to a vegan. Can I, yes, can I uh, throw out on one last uh, question maybe for the time we have? But 
You know, one of the things that sort of surprised me was, um, and and you started off with it is, uh, or we started off with it, is that uh, fallenness is kind of translates to weakness. But the the weakness of a of God's design for us is not only in creation before the fall, but in the new creation, and it, mm. that that just it's something I hadn't really thought. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, if, if weakness, again, is the inability to act or produce an effect on your own, um, new creation, it, we, we're we remade by God's power. We can't remake ourselves. And we, we live in a world where apparently we have to eat and drink. Uh, we eat from the tree of life and, and drink from the stream of the water of life, and it sustains us. For eternity, so we're sustained by something outside of ourselves, and we walk in the light of the Lamb. And by the way, who is the Lamb that gives us bread and water and light? He's the Lamb who was slaughtered. You know, the Lion is mentioned once in Revelation, and it's a way of getting us. L- Here's the Lion. Look at him, and what what John sees, and what we see afterwards. Is the, lion, is the lamb who was slaughtered, a man who stands with signs and evidence of weakness in his body. He has wounds that killed him, and he overcame it. And so that the weakness of a crucified and risen Savior will be the centerpiece of God's glory for eternity. Oh, man, that's a good way to land the plane. Eric, thank you, man. Uh, you, uh, you've done good. This is a great book, and I hope that it sells and changes the face of the church because it's a book that we need. Eric, thanks for spending this hour with us. And you're supposed to. Yeah, you're supposed to say that. (laughs) (laughs) The name of the book is The Good Gift of Weakness. The author, Eric Shoemaker. on this broadcast, I think thoughts I haven't thought before in ways I haven't thought them before. And Eric does that to us. What a great um, release and freedom as long as you don't see it as a brief for weakness. You know, there there is a danger, I think, sometimes for, uh, for Christians to misread the message. You're forgiven. You're weak. Uh, you, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. All of that is true, but that doesn't mean you don't do anything. It means that all of a sudden you have a source of power uh, that you didn't have before. And you can do things you couldn't do before. And you can go places you were afraid to go before. And you can make a difference in a lot of lives that you couldn't before. And it's because of him, as long as you recognize that, rejoice in what he does. I'm convinced uh, that God doesn't use very much obedient, faithful, self-righteous people, strong people. I really don't. I think when we put a star on the stage because of how fast they can go and the game they play and the movie they were in, I don't think it does dink. I don't think it changes lives. I don't, I don't think that's what God uses. I think God uses normal, sinful, weak people like you and me. And, uh, and he uses them because we know he shouldn't. He uses them because they know that shouldn't happen. And it does happen. And when it does, you can rejoice and dance and sing and speak in tongues. Unless you're a Presbyterian, then you don't do any of that. You just sit there and say, but of course. (laughs) (laughs) Who's going to be on next week? Next week, our 
our dear friend Robert Walgamuth is going to be with us, and Robert is the um, he's been in publishing for a million years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he um, is the general editor of a new Bible uh, that has just come out. It's called the Men's Daily Bible. Father's Day is coming up, um, and one of the things that he's done that's made this really unique is he's asked. Um, very famous, well-known Christians from all over the place to write little snippets that have gone in different places throughout the Bible. And and, slipped up. And, and <laughs> on page 1315, lest you think I don't uh, pay okay. attention, is The Wonder of God's Grace, which was written by Mr. Brown. Wow. And I read it. I know dirt on Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I made him do it. Guys, we got to get out of here. Time is up. We're going to do it again next week, same time, same place. Hope you join us. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. Get a Bible. It's only for men.